Uh, the time having arrived, we'll call this meeting of the Brockton School Committee to order, and I ask everyone to please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome everyone. Uh, at this time is when we have the availability for hearing of visitors when any member of the public may address the school committee directly. And prior to each meeting we have a sign up sheet if there is a resident that would like to take advantage of that. And uh, this evening no one signed up to address the school committee. So we'll move on with the agenda. The next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Um, this is routine business before the school committee that in order to have a more expeditious meeting we lump it all together to vote on it as a package however individual members of the school committee reserve the right to request that any particular item in the consent agenda be taken out of the consent agenda for individual discussion so at this time I'll ask if any members of the committee would like to remove any items from the consent agenda before we take action Mr. Minicello. Item C, approval of minutes from the school committee retreat. Okay, item C. Anyone else? All right, seeing no others, I will entertain a motion on the consent agenda minus item C. Do we have a second? All in favor? Approved. So the consent agenda minus item C is approved. Mr. Minicello, item C. Um, we had a um, school committee retreat. Our retreats are held locally here in Brockton. Um, and uh, I just wanted to state for the record that I thought it was a very productive day. Um, the mayor was able to attend and give us a few hours, a couple of hours of his time, which is, was great. Our new members for the first time were present and were um, brought up to speed on certain issues and were very productive and um, I thought uh, very uh, engaged. So I just wanted to um, compliment the, the committee. I think going forward, um, there, as we all know, there are big issues that we're going to be tackling, um, but I think that this is going to be a committee that can work together and um, just from that one day I, I was very impressed with everyone's involvement and um, I look forward to working with the whole committee going forward including our new mayor that's it okay do you have a motion a motion to approve Second. there's a motion on the floor to approve um, item C any discussion on the motion all in favor approved unanimously all right, we'll move on to the report of the superintendent of schools. Good evening. Uh, as always, we start with our student representative, Jessica Freeborn. It's great to see you back, Jess. Hi, and uh, okay. take the floor. All right, well, we haven't had too much of a busy week this week, but um, today at, B um, at BHS, we had our school-wide science fair which was a success. The projects were amazing, as always. Um, freshman orientation is coming up for all eighth graders. It is February 26th at 6 p.m. Um, on Friday, February 28th at 7.30 p.m., our drama club will perform a preview of their competition piece, Wiley and the Hairy Man, which will be awesome, I've heard. Um, and this Friday, February 14th, begins our vacation. And that's it. I'm excited. You've had a little too much vacation. Snow. <laughs> <laughs> now, to be honest, I completely agree. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> competition this morning, so mm -hmm. that's great, the science fair. And, uh, oh, yeah, the projects and, were great uh, this year. And Mrs. Meek was kind enough to send me a picture of of Matt so I was having a hectic day and it put a smile on my face so <laughs> thank you Jocelyn. <laughs> Mr. Manichel did you notice the eye contact with the camera? Oh no. <laughs> you, you could take a, uh, oh. a, a page from that when you're in the court. There you go thank you thank you. So good luck with your competition. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I'd also like to uh, talk about the uh, Commissioner Mitchell Chester visited our district at our invitation uh, last Thursday morning. Uh, like happens, I think, to all of us that get into Boston traffic, he was a little bit delayed in traffic. And what he did want to see was our breakfast in the classroom that goes on at the Brookfield School. He wasn't able to actually make it to see that, but many of you were there. Uh, we had a number of administrators come, school committee members come, the mayor was present, and I think you got to see how quickly this happens, and you've heard me talk about it, where the, the carts uh, with the coolers are rolled into the classroom, the children are doing work, they're in their seats, everybody has an opportunity to have breakfast, and very quickly it's over, it's cleaned up, and we've been very, very pleased about it. Uh, he did have an opportunity to visit a couple of classrooms while he was at the Brookfield. Uh, Principal Brower took him around, and and he does a, a weekly commissioner's uh, report to all the superintendents and administrators in the DESE, and he highlighted his visit to Brockton with one of our students. I think it was in uh, Miss Kelly's class in a sheltered English immersion grade two classroom at the Brookfield. We also went to the Baker School, and we went into a number of classrooms. Uh, it was interesting, and we've talked about this with the executive team. He was truly engaged with our students. It wasn't just going in and seeing a classroom, he sat down, he talked to students, he discussed some of the lessons. At the Baker School in Jeannie Marchesio's class, this is one of our special needs self-contained classes, they were talking about the Winter Olympics and the things that the kids knew. Uh, the commissioner at one point said to them, well, do you realize that, that Russia uh, is uh, between two continents? And the kids were able to pull the map down. They started to tell him that they knew the distance from the United States to, to Sochi, Russia. It was a fabulous lesson, and I, I think he was really surprised at certainly the, the level uh, of instruction with the children in that class and what they were able to answer. More than that, we had close to an hour focus group, which involved a number of our principals. We'll be talking about that tonight during the presentation. We talked about our successes. We talked about our challenges. Um, I, he had discussions with uh, Kim Gibson, our BEA president, and myself, the superintendent. Uh, again, I thought it was an excellent dialogue. The highlight of the visit, and I keep telling all of you, was to go to our kindergarten center at the Barrett Russell. And at that point, he was able to see the rigor of the instruction going on at your kindergarten. Children are writing. This is, this is early February. You know, they're writing. They're doing the writing across the curriculum as five-year-olds. We have emerging readers. You know, the projects they were doing in the centers, the behavior in the classrooms. It was absolutely phenomenal. And when he left, you know, I don't know the commissioner well. Obviously, you know, this is new. I went to a meeting on Friday with the urban superintendents. He came up to me and said to me, I want you to know the visit to Brockton was excellent. And he proceeded to tell the rest of the urban superintendents, you know, how the visit had gone. So again, we will invite him back. Uh, I think we had very good dialogue and we spoke very openly about some of the things that we're facing. Also, uh, just to tie on to that with the breakfast uh, in the classroom, we also received a letter from the DESE from Kate Millette. And we received an award because we have increased breakfast, you had to increase by up to 35%. So we have gone from, we've done this a year, it's been a pilot program for a year, and we have increased from somewhere around, I think, 22 to 30%, close to 85 to 90% of children have been breakfast you know, in our classrooms. And uh, one of the things you would ask is where we're going from here. Uh, we're working very closely with uh, our unions, and what we're doing is we're having a, a task force where a number of schools, I believe, Self, uh, I'm not sure if it's Kennedy. I'm looking for Liz Barry. The schools that we're continuing to have discussions. We're actually looking at the Angelo right now. So. Angelo and Self, where we're having discussions and bringing teams together to talk about what this would look like in their school if we were to pilot it in additional sites. And that is my hope that we'll be able to do that. So, any any questions about the breakfast in the classroom or? Um, the numbers are phenomenal, how we've grown that program. That was the Brookfield in particular that you mentioned. It, it went Brookfield. from like 20 to 85 percent. If you could put your, your, you know, your finger on one thing that really triggered the, that huge increase, what would it be? 
what, what I'm told is, again, parents are rushing, they're trying to get their kids there, so when breakfast is going on in the cafeteria, many times school has begun, the child mm -hmm. might be just getting in the door, the breakfast is over. So by waiting to serve the breakfast, and they're right there ready, as soon as we watch the kids, you know, come in from the outside, you know, get to their classrooms, that breakfast is right there, it's right outside their door. It's all labeled, it, it's filled by our cafeteria workers with the cold drinks, the uh, whatever, that day it was actually a dry, I think it was granola bars, I believe it was uh, graham bars, I think it had some fruit in it. It's right there to go, so the children come up very orderly, they get their breakfast. In looking at a classroom of about 24 youngsters, I was in a fourth grade class, I counted three youngsters that just chose not to yeah. take that. So by virtue of that, you have 21 kids having breakfast, and again, not losing learning time, because they're doing their before school work. The teacher was instruct, you know, instructing the children at that time. So basically, it's moving it from the cafeteria to the classroom that made the big difference. And the time. And the time. Remember, we're taking yeah. the time when school is in right. session yeah. and the children, you know, are there attending. Well, I know one of the challenges I had with my own kids, it wasn't the fact that they didn't have the opportunity to have breakfast at home. It's just that by the time they got up and they were getting ready, they weren't hungry right away. But once they got to school, they'd been up an hour to an hour and a half, and then they decide, oh, I'm hungry now. And I think that's a lot of it right there. You know, if they can't eat right when they get up, or right when they get dressed, they're going to eat when they get to school. And if they can eat in the classroom and do maybe a worksheet or their morning work, I think it's a win-win. Well, I have to tell you, uh, you now many years ago when I went to school, I was not a breakfast eater. I had to get out of the house, and, and I would hate to tell you because it was very unhealthy, but one of the things they did in our classes was during the recess break, they would sell every bit of junk you could imagine. You know, they would sell potato chips, candy bars, you name it, and I was so hungry at that time, that was the kind of eating that went on. Now, the good news about this is when you talk about, as you said, some children are rushing to get out, the day has started, they're sitting there with their classmates, they're eating, as I said, sometimes a hot breakfast, other days a cold breakfast. Many of them are also saving a little for the snack, and it's a healthy snack. So that's what they're getting from the time, let's say they finish up at nine o'clock until it would be their lunchtime, they have a little bit of a snack time, and it's a working snack, I'm told. I'm also told by the principal that they've been able to adjust some of the lunch times for some of the older kids that weren't eating until one o'clock. Yeah, it's a long so time. They're having a large block of learning because we know that every one of them ate, you know, just before nine o'clock. So they've been able to adjust some of the lunch times. It's a longer, you know, time for instructional. Uh, block in the classroom. It's uh, It's been very positive at the Brookfield School and I'll continue to, to report back to you as we hope to uh you know, unveil other sites. It's really great to see this expanding, especially in the older grades as well. Not just the primary grades, but our middle school and and um, you know upper elementary school grades. So that's really great. Sure. So uh, if I just wrote a quick comment, uh, I, I was there to see the breakfast in the classroom and Mr. Healy, Mr. Minicello, Mr. Robinson were all there and I know that Andy's been the big proponent of this uh, program since early on, has done a lot of work on it. I was amazed at how seamless it was. It absolutely was not disruptive in any way whatsoever. While the kids were eating, they were doing schoolwork at their desks quietly. Um, even the food and, the, and the, the trash being collected afterwards, there's a student from each room who everything goes back in the container. One student takes it, it's on wheels, wheels it down the end of the hall and uh, kidding around with a couple of the older people like myself that were there. It's kind of like, you know, when we were kids growing up, uh, getting the, have the teacher pick you to go clap out the erasers. You know, you get to go for a walk for five minutes and uh, get out of the class. But it was, um, it was amazing. I, you know, I've always been a strong supporter of universal breakfast. I think it really makes a big difference in a lot of ways to the kids. And you look at those numbers at Brookfield are amazing. So I know we've got some issues to work out with the people who work for us, but um, I was just thoroughly impressed with the program. I think it's good for the kids. It's good for learning. And for that school to go from 25 or 30 percent to 85 to 90 percent of the kids eating breakfast in the morning, I think is uh, is incredible in the way that it's just been incorporated into the school day that it's not taking anything away from teaching and learning in the classroom. I, I believe it's actually helping teaching and learning by giving the kids a good healthy breakfast at the beginning of the day. So I, it was, Andy, congratulations for bringing it in and I know all the school committee members that were there um, were impressed with the program. It really was something. 
Let's go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Andy. I'm sorry. I mean, certainly I can't in no way take full credit for this. I, I was fortunate to be able to. I wasn't giving you yeah. full credit. Yeah. But I, yeah. <laughs> I was, I was, Typical politician. Now no, but full I, was, credit. I was fortunate. <laughs> I gave you some credit, Andy. Yeah. But, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to discount the folks within our district who really have fought hard for this. I was fortunate to be in a position to, to be the ambassador at, uh, as the school committee representative of, of this. And, um, you know, there's just even too many people to name, but, you know, our wellness department, our nurses, our, our custodians have cooperated, you know, in the buildings where this is working and all finding a way to make this work, you know, beyond increasing teaching and learning, I bet you over the long term we'll see a decrease in absence, absences, a decrease in referrals to the nurse's office, a decrease in discipline issues. It, it would thoroughly surprise me if we don't see those things happen as well, and in, in including over time an increase in MCAS or, or parks course, you know, as, as we make that transition. This is, we tell every kid the day before MCAS that it's important, it's point. you know, to get a great night's sleep and to eat breakfast before they come to school because tomorrow's MCAS. Well, every day is an important learning and teaching day and, and the idea that we wouldn't put the same value on sleep and breakfast um, every single day because of the way we know it, it aids in, in an MCAS day it is beyond me. I, I look forward to the day where this is in every school in our district um, and the sooner it can happen the better off we're all going to be. Anyone else? Go ahead, okay. Superintendent. Uh, I believe this is the first reading of the calendar for the next school year. And uh, one of the things that's notable is, uh, thank goodness, we're able to start Labor Day is on the 1st of September, which allows us some early leeway in September. We'd start school uh, for teachers reporting on the 2nd. The first day of school for students would be September 3rd. There has been talk about you know, adjusting the calendar with, with some of the religious holidays. I do want you to know we obviously are going into bargaining uh, with the teachers union. Um, my hope is we'll be able to start to have some discussion about the calendar. Uh, this year we do have um, Rosh Hashanah that does fall in the month of September, a Thursday and a Friday. I believe Yom Kippur is uh, on a Saturday. We would finish the year up on June 18th, uh, that's without any snow days, and our graduation day for our seniors from Brockton High would be again on Saturday, the 6th of June, 2015, which gives us some additional time for rain dates if in fact we encountered that. We're also building into the calendar, and certainly not at this reading, uh, we'll be building in professional development and we'll share that with you, you know, with the next reading of the calendar. Questions? Questions Guess not. Just the first reading. We're not taking any action on this item tonight. Okay. And at this point here, I'd like to. Um, we had the MCAS data presentation that was scheduled uh, two weeks ago. It was the night of. We had snow that night, of course. We weren't sure that everybody would be able to be here, so we wanted to hold off, and we're going to do that this evening. So at this point, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Ethan Cancel and Elizabeth Barry, our uh, Executive Director of uh, Teaching and Learning, Pre-K to 5, to come up and, and to share that with you. Yes, I'm gonna, I know, I'm going to they told me to. Okay, okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, very glad that you all put on your uh, best for the data presentation. I appreciate it. Did the same thing last time. Tonight, we want to really focus on how the results and the data inform our actions. That's really going to be a key piece of the presentation. We have performance, which is measured by MCAS that we're going to look at. We have growth, which is measured by the student growth percentile. And not to disappoint Mr. Robinson, we have accountability status, which the state has. Now, all of that leads to actions. And this is really the part that we want to focus on. And um, quite frankly, we need to be judged on how um, the data informs real actions and what those actions result in. So I want to do a little bit of a review, especially for our newer members on the school committee. Um, there are a lot of terms that we throw around like CPI, so 
be a good idea to explain them. CPI is the Composite Performance Index. When you take the MCAS, you get a scaled score. If you score in the proficient or advanced level, the highest levels of the test, you get 100 points according to the state's CPI. If you score in the needs improvement high, so that's a scaled score between 230 and 238, you get 75 points. If you score needs improvement low, you get 50 points. If, you fail in the, if you're in the warning failing high category, you get 25 points, and if you're in the lowest, the 200 to the 208, you get zero points. So what you do is you average all those points up for every student, and then you get a CPI. So that's, that's the measure the state uses. CPI, you'll hear it, that's what it comes from. So the big question is, how did we do? So you see the orange line, that's ELA. You see the blue line. That's math, and the uh, you know the the CPI for ELA it has gone down slightly since 2010, down 1.6 points. It's flat from last year. Now math is a slightly uh, more positive story. It's gone up over this uh, period. It's gone up almost two points, and it actually had a very nice gain. It's important to remember the context that we, we operate in the state. The state has been seeing similar uh, challenges in ELA. In math, the state was very interested in what we were doing uh, because we, we outgained the state at uh, certain levels. So how did we do at the elementary? That was all a review. This is new. You've never seen this chart before. It shows the schools at the elementary level, and includes our K through um, eight, Davis and Raymond, except it's broken out only by the grades three through eight. And you see what uh, Dr. Tross would call, in technical language, a uh, pretty widespread there. The variation is big, from the top score of 77 for CPI and ELA, down to 59.5. That's a pretty big uh, spread there. You also see some schools that have a red outline. Those are our focus or our priority schools. So that just uh, shows you what the story is. Again, you want to be at 100. That would mean everyone is proficient or advanced. So this is the distribution that we have. Grades 6 through 8, you'll see a different story. The spread is much more narrow. You see that most of your schools, all but two of your middle schools are within four points, between 84.4 to 80.6. And you have, again, you have two schools that have the red bar around them. They are the um, focus or priority schools. And so that's for the ELA. Now, this is the math CPI. The spread you see is, again, pretty big from 77 down to 61. So that's a pretty decent amount of difference. You do see the Huntington School up there towards the top. Now, the Huntington School is our first, was our first superintendent priority school. And it's been very, uh, I'm very happy to report that it's really increased steadily in math. So this is a very positive sign. We see that the spread is a little greater among the <coughs> schools in math at the uh, middle grade level. And again, you see that the Raymond, although it may not be leading the pack at the elementary level, it's pretty solid at the middle school level. And that's important to recognize that you can be a, you're judged in total, but you can have different stories going on at different grade levels within one school. Grade five, they only, this is science, they only offer the test in grade five and grade eight. So you're only gonna see grade five and grade eight um, rather than three through five. And you can see where the priority and focus schools are and you can see a really substantial spread between a 70 down to a 45. It's, it, it is what it is, but that is a dramatic uh, difference. Similar story, again, when you're almost at 30 points, difference between the highest and lowest, there's, there's quite a lot of variation there as opposed to um, the ELA where they're all kind of close together. But again, you see that this is the result of just being one grade, and you do see where our uh, focus and priority schools are. 
Okay, so now we transition. That was my beautiful transition it's slide. Fancy. Thank you. <laughs> Sparkly. Um, this 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 state has a growth model, and it's it's very confusing. But I just want to go over it briefly. They're academic peer groups. That's what really determines your growth. So every student in the state is compared to students with a similar score history. And again, it's not similar students in Brockton, it's similar students across the state. And it's not similar students, I said that wrong, it's students with a similar score history. So we'll, go, we'll give you some examples that make that make more sense. Just want to review some terms. Percentiles, the state growth percentile is pretty much set at 50. So if you're doing, if you're at 50 or above, you're doing well. And just so we know what we're talking about, when we say the 70th percentile, we mean you're doing better than 70%. So there you go. This is the state's example. There are three different students. There are three different academic peer groups. So you can see there's student one who's in the purple group, student two in the blue group, and student three in the yellow group. All this is saying is for student one, student one was a fourth grader in 2011, and student one scored a 230 back then. By the time that student got to fifth grade, they scored a 236. So what the state does is it says every student who scored a 230 and a 236 in grades four and five, they're in this academic peer group. Then they rank order their sixth grade score. And if you rank order them all, the 232 turns out to be in the 40th percentile. So you're better than 40%, you're worse than 60%. It's not spectacular, it's not terrible. And then you start to say, well, huh. You know, student two has a much higher score. How come the student growth percentile is low? What that's telling you is students with this score history of 268 and 268, most of them do better than a 260. And with student three, most students who have a 214 and a 214 in these grades in, in those years, most of them do not do better than a 226. So that's the student growth percentile. You're compared to students within your um, academic peer group. It's mysterious because the, you cannot, as a, a private citizen, you cannot figure out where, where the kids, you do not have student level data, so you cannot figure out exactly who's in a group, how many years of data they're using, but that's the concept behind it. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting concept and that's how the state chooses to measure growth. So it doesn't necessarily mean you went up or down from last year. It means compared to kids with your score history, this is how you did. It's a relative term. So how did we do? That's the big question. In, in ELA, our growth went from a 50 to a 54, which is a three-point gain. In math, we went from a 42 to a 53. I'm sorry, 54, which is a four-point gain. Uh, well, let me try and speak English. Thank you, Liz. Liz is helping with math. I'm in trouble. It's 12 <laughs> points. She's absolutely right. What this tells us is this is good news. Anytime you're above 50, that's a good story. It means that this is the median, the median, the middle score. So there are going to be kids above it, there are going to be kids below it, but the middle score is above 50. That's better than the state. That's good. So in growth, Brockton as a district is doing a nice job. How does it break out at the different school level? Well, you see that in ELA, you see that we go from a 55 to a 37. Again, it's a pretty decent amount of spread. There's a, a big difference there between the top and the bottom. Anytime you're in the 50s or close to 50s, you're doing pretty well. So the vast majority of schools are doing okay. So that's, that's an important takeaway. There are a couple schools where the scores are lower than we'd like to see, but by and large, this is a sort of indication where our students may not start out at the top, but they're making reasonable amounts of growth according to the state's definition. Six through eight, it's a slightly more upbeat story. It's, it's, it's positive. You still see a large spread, but anytime you see all but two of your schools 
just about at 50. That's terrific, and the other school that isn't is right there at 50. So this is a very strong uh, growth pattern for ELA in grades six through eight. That's the takeaway from this slide. And you also see the uh, priority and focus schools right up there at the top for growth. So that's a very important and very uh, good sign. Take a look at math. This spread, the spreads really become large in math, and I don't know why that is. We need to look into it some more. But you really see a difference of almost 30 points between the, a 65.5 and a 36.5. And you also see where the uh, priority and focus schools end up. But again, all but two schools are at 50 or above. So the 50 is, unlike CPI, the 50 is a very good score. Remember that. So this is a very positive slide with the exception of uh, the two schools. Another slide that shows a large amount of uh, variation, but the other thing it shows is every school is above 50. So this is a really positive slide. You really want to be happy about a slide like this, and you definitely want to be happy when you see a priority or a focus school, in this case both, doing above 50 for growth. So that's a very positive slide. We transition over to the new state accountability system, which is now in about its second or third year, it's called, the term they use is the Progress and Performance Index, PPI. So we have CPI, which measures how you do on MCAS, and you have PPI, which puts all these different things together. One of the major measures that they use is proficiency gap narrowing. So they say, we want you to be at 100%. You are where you are. We want you to cut that in half. And then you have a set number of years to cut it in half. So that's what they mean. And that's an ELA in math and science. Then you have the student growth percentile. We just covered what that is. And then there are these bonus points. You get bonus points if you increase the amount of students scoring at the advanced level, and if you decrease the amount of students scoring at the warning failure level. So there are a lot of different terms that come into this very comp comprehensive, complicated index. They make it even a little more complicated by having annual PPI and cumulative PPI. Annual PPI, I think, is an important thing to focus on. It tells you how you're doing year to year. The cumulative is a four-year weighted average. The reason they use that is for accountability status. And then just to give you a little uh, indication of what these points mean. It's interesting, you get 75 points if you're on target. 75 is a very, very challenging target, okay? So if you're doing 75 or above, you are doing really, really well. 100 is above target, 50 is improved, but you didn't quite make their target. 25 is you haven't changed, and zero is you declined. So th this is, We've talked about CPI, which is 0 to 100, where you really do want to see people getting to 100. And at certain grade levels, we have schools scoring in the 90s. Student growth percentile, 50 is, is good. PPI, 75 is, is good. And it's, it's a tough, it really is a tough uh, bar right there. How did we do? It's nice to see that we have this gain. We're not quite at 75, but 64 is not bad. And you can see that we're really uh, doing a better job on our PPI scores compared to 2010, 2011. And I think that this is in part the school's really putting some focus and some effort into attacking the different areas that the index picks up which um, CPI may not pick it up on its own, growth may not pick it up on its own, but when you start combining it, it it's, I think it's starting to capture some of the uh, efforts. This is probably the most important chart for the night. Um, this is the John Jerome special. It was John who I had two terrible looking slides and John suggested two years ago that I combine them. And we did and it's, it's a, a very important slide. Let me try and explain it. The pink bars, John had, had no say in the colors. I don't think he would have chosen pink or magenta. Neither did I. <laughs> but the pink bars are PPI. The boxes of yellow, that's the percentile for ELA and math. 
it's a state law that the bottom 20% of schools cannot be a level one or two according to the state's accountability system. You would think that the only thing that matters is PPI. It does accept this 20% rule. So when you look at the schools <clears throat> to the left, you see those schools can be level one or level two depending on if they make their targets. To the right, no matter how well they've done, and I've got East circled there with 115. Now remember, 75 means you're making it. This school's at 115, which means they're getting every bonus point you can. East, because it's in the 14th percentile compared to all schools that educate its grade level, it cannot be a level one, it cannot be a level two school. So that's, that's important to uh, point out. It's also important to see that we have a range from 31st percentile down to the first percentile. Ian, could you repeat that for me? Okay, so if you look all the way over on the left, you have a 31. That means that Brockton High School is in the 31st percentile of all high schools in the state. Down to all the way on the right, you have one, which is the first percentile, which means it is in the 99% of the schools are scoring higher than that just on straight CPI. They don't care if you have students with disabilities, they don't care what size you are, it just is a sheer comparison. That's what it is. And <clears throat> what this sh Comparison without taking into account any of the... Nothing. Okay. Run it's up. just right. every single school in the state, doesn't matter what they look like. The, the reason why we show this slide and why this slide is so important, that black bar is an important separator, but the other reason we have those circles, you can see how much concern there is because if you're in, if you're in the right side of, of the bar, you could be a level three, a level four, or a level five school. What does that mean? Level three isn't good. The, the next slide will go through, the state will show you. Level four, that's when the state really starts to pick up its um, presence and intervenes in your school. And level five is when they take it over or have someone else take it over and manage the school for you. It's up to the discretion of the commissioner, but anytime you're in the fifth percentile or lower, it's an area of real, real concern. That's why we have the schools circled that we do. And the really positive thing on, on this slide is Huntington and East were in really rough shape prior to our interventions where they've really improved. So we're gonna go into that, but here is, this is the state's slide and, and it shows you the, the levels. That big cut is between levels one and two and levels three, four, and five, and it's, it's by definition the lowest 20% of schools. So um, there's some real stakes attached and that's why we've uh, been concerned. So superintendent priority and focus schools. That's the data, well, what have we done? We, we named two priority schools years ago, Huntington and East, and we've been working real hard with these schools and we'll show you the results. And we've named focus schools because we've been concerned about the uh, performance of Arnone, Baker, and Raymond and the level of support we've been able to give them. So, we shift over to how did our priority schools, our priority schools, these were the ones who really set everything in motion for us. We learned a lot of important lessons. We piloted a lot of uh, the things that we're gonna talk about tonight at these schools. So how did Huntington do? Well, here's the ELA, here's the math. You can see a 4.6 point gain in ELA and a 14.5 gain in math. Now you might say, well the ELA 4.6 points, remember the state's flat pretty much at this time, and Brockton in many cases was down. So this is actually quite good because I can assure you the Huntington's clientele did not become easier to educate in this time. So this is actually a very positive slide in terms of achievement. Science, you see it's a small gain, but what I'm heartened by is 
you start to see that there was a real increase in 2011, 2012. We're definitely heading in the right direction in science as June and her crew have figured out some of the challenges with our curriculum in science and we've been working and Huntington has often uh, led things, some innovations. Here's the growth, solid growth again, anytime you're at 50, you're doing well and you see the gains, so those are nice. And the PPI scores are, you know, 40 point gain, we'll take that and uh, it is what it is. Anytime you're at 90, that's that's quite good when 75 is on target. So East, East is another priority school and it, it's a great story. You see that that CLA goes from a 63 up to a 72.7, almost 10 point gain. And in math, there is a 10 point gain. Kelly will tell you, as the principal of East, she's still not happy with the scores where they are, but this is, this is nice improvement and it wasn't just a one-year kind of deal. They've been steadily getting better. So that's a very positive sign. So that's the CPI, and then here's science. Science has bounced around a little bit. It's not quite as dramatic again, but four points will definitely take. And again, when you consider it was down to a 37, that's, that's a nice gain. Growth is a great story over at East. It's uh, gone around, but on the whole, you know, we'll take 17 points, we'll take 22 points, and anytime you're above 50, you're doing well, so we're happy about that. We've already talked about the PPI. It's just through the roof phenomenal. A 95 point gain, it's at 115, we're jumping for joy. I hope, did you see that? Oh. Okay, there it is. Okay. So the lessons learned, this, you know, it's, it's great to brag about the improvement, but we really learned some important lessons who've been at this for a number of years. I lead with this one because the school committee support and investment was an, in, in, this was an important lesson that we learned. You know, it, it's, I just tell it like it is. The school committee went out on a limb and invested in these schools in very tough economic times. The support though, that's, that's the financial side. The support though was really important. The support was, we're gonna give you this investment only when we're comfortable with the level of your plan. So, the Huntington School came up here and they presented and then they presented again and then they presented again and as the faculty really got behind it, the plan got sharper and sharper, the school committee went along with it and then you kept tabs on them. So that was very good. Uh, I don't know if June would say it was enjoyable but same thing with East and one thing that um, I've, I've said this before and I'll say it again. We got really strong feedback from the Department of Education. We went, we applied for a big grant for East, and we went to the department. You know, they interview us for, uh, it's a very competitive process. We were the only level three school going for this grant. It's really for level four schools. And the feedback we got, uh, Bill Carpenter was there as a school committee person, and they said they were really impressed by the commitment of the school committee. So. That kind of support, we found out, is really important. We also found out site-based redesign and flexibility. You have to give the school leadership some flexibility. They operate within the Brockton Public Schools, but they do things a little bit differently. Maybe uniforms, <coughs> maybe a, a magnet of some sort, but that was very important. They definitely have to have a plan. A district liaison turns out that this is an important role. Both the schools put professional learning communities in place, they use Pearson learning teams, and when we, we ask them every year, we're, we're very curious, what, what do you attribute success to? What's really helpful? What do you really like? This came up as very important. Protected class size, that was something that's, that's a really uh, tough, tough one because we're really bursting at the seams, but we've done our best to protect the class size and that meant it, it really made a difference and expanded learning opportunities. These schools are struggling, they have large challenges, you need to expand the learning opportunities, we learned that. And we also learned that it can be very costly. We pretty much know what to do. The challenge is 
can we afford to do what we want to do and how can we uh, manage the cost? So those were some important lessons that we learned from our priority schools. And now we have our focus schools. We have our known Raymond and Baker. And we'll start with the unknown. You can see the ELA scores, in there are the math scores. Over the time from 2010 to 2013, the ELA has gone down a bit. Math has gone up a bit. But I'd say, let's focus on 2012. There are some real important interventions that Liz Baer and her team started to put in that year. And those have led to some really nice growth. Um, we're hoping that this is a trend that continues. The early signs, and you know, what are early signs? But the early signs are very positive that this will continue. So um, we're very happy about that. Science tells a uh, very similar story. It's, it's a slight uh, decrease from back in 2010. On the other hand, it's a nice increase from 2012 and 2011. The student growth is a good story, especially in math. Anytime you're above um, the 50 threshold, you're doing really well. Anytime you gain 28 points, you're really doing something right. Arnone did not have a very high percentile compared to all the other schools in the state. But I had uh, colleagues and former uh, associates at the state asking, what's their known doing? What's Brockton doing at the elementary level in math? And of course, I refer them to Dr. Ronan, and uh, they can find out. <laughs> Good job, Heather. There you are. Um, this, is, this is a really nice growth story. I'm not going to downplay the ELA. Anytime you're close to 50, it's OK. But it is down. Yes, it's up from the 30s. But it's not quite the story we want to see. I'm sure that. Um, Colleen and her crew have something worked out. So this is a, a positive story. It's not all roses, though, but it's positive for growth. And the PPI is just a terrific one. I mean, this is just phenomenal. And you can see the struggles that the school was having back in 2010, 2011, and even 2012, where, yes, that's a nice increase, but it's still 25. 95 is just terrific. So this is a nice story. Baker School. Baker, you can see the ELA, you can see the math. ELA is down, <laughs> math is down over this period. But again, when we're, we're looking at positive things that we're, we want to build on, the interventions started to come in in 2012, the leadership change. And we really started to put some things in place there. And so we are starting to see some positive signs. We, we are concerned about ELA, though. There's no two ways about it. Math has definitely picked up from 2012. ELA has picked up, but it hasn't picked up at the same level. So we've, we've got our work cut out for us there. And science. Science is a little concerning because the other grades, you saw an increase from 2012. Science, you're still seeing a little decrease. But I will say, remember, that's only fifth grade. You have a strong year or a weak year, and you know it's one grade. It, it's, it's hard to draw real big conclusions from one grade, one year. Student growth, this is actually the slide that troubles me the most. While there's been improvement in, in the ELA or the, the math and CPI terms, or at least in certain grades, the growth wasn't where we wanted it to be. Now, I worry less about did it go up and down six or four points, but I do worry that it's below the sort of 40, 45, 50 threshold. So this is an area of concern. I think that as you see the, the changes taking place, it's going to be harder to pick this up because grades four and five, the kids have been in the school longer. It's harder to move those grades along. Grades three, they don't count for student growth because they only have one year of data. So I'm hoping that we'll see as uh, this, this happened at Huntington, by the way. I'm hoping that as the years go on and the kids have been there longer in the new and improved system, you'll start to see the growth catch up. It's almost like it's a lagging indicator. The PPI, the bad news is it's down. The good news is it's up dramatically from 2011. This is the only school in Brockton, and I'm not picking on them. I'm just saying a fact. It's the only school in Brockton with a zero. 
And so to go from a zero to a 55, that's, that is a lot of improvement. But it's definitely um, a school that we're concerned about. Raymond is an interesting uh, case. It's basically flat, but that can be hidden because they're really two different stories. There's the elementary story and there's the middle school story. So we're going to talk about that. And here's science. It's, it's down and that's, that is concerning. There are two grades, fifth and eighth grade. Here's the student growth. Student growth is solid and the gains are solid. So that's good. We're, we're happy about that. Let's take a look at the grades three through five at the Raymond. You see that the score isn't very high and you see that it's, it's down low compared to other um, schools. And the, in math, there was a gain, a nice gain from 2012. But it's definitely something that, you know, points itself as a challenge. And the science, that's an area of concern for us. Now, sixth grade, it's a, it's a different story because you see how much higher the uh, scores are. Again, though, the scores are down a little bit. And this is reason for concern. We see some areas where there's improvement, like from 2011 up to 2013 in math, but we're concerned. But I do want to point out, this is what tells me an important story about Raymond. This isn't a mistake. This is grade eight. This is ELA. I remember going over Carol's scores with her um, right when the scores were still embargoed. And I said, what the heck's going on in eighth grade? And she said, well, it takes a while with our kids, but by the time they get to eighth grade, as you can see, they're leading the district. So that's, that's really impressive. There are definite strengths to build on. It is a challenging school. It's a large school. We have that you know, crazy pod design, which is not conducive to good education, but you can see that they're able to work through the challenges. They do need time to work through the challenges, but they definitely get the results. That's, that is a strength to build on. And then you see science, where again, you see the gain. Um, it's just, it's lower than we'd like to see. The PPI, the, it's down from 2010, but boy, is it up dramatically from 2011. And 65 is not a bad PPI, OK? 75 means you're on target. 50 means you're improving, but you're not quite on target. 65, that's nice. So I get to shift. Let me okay, give you the you clicker. Oh, I'll keep doing it, sure. OK. So actually, before we discuss specific schools, one of the things that I wanted to do, and I'll just take a moment to do this, um, is really just to talk about some of the things that we put in place in all of our elementary schools, as well as our 2K to 8s. Um, this is our third year of implementing some very targeted professional development for um, all teachers to strengthen their practice. Um, teachers are working very, very hard, and we really are starting to see um, some results at the elementary level. Um, the first practice that I just want to talk about briefly is understanding by design in math. We've talked about this before in other um, formats, but basically each grade level, um, K to 5, is getting four full days of structured collaboration um, with their grade level colleagues so that they are developing their math units together. They're using um, resources that we have as well as the programs that we have, and they are working to develop units together with their colleagues. Um, the the second thing that we have done over the past couple of years is we've brought citywide professional development trainings back which um, all teachers at this point in time, by the end of this year, all teachers K to 5 will have received some kind of half-day training with um, the entire grade level uh, in um, targeted math instruction. We focus on writing. We also focus on um, some strategies in literacy. Um, and despite all that's going on, I will say, um, you know, teachers have embraced these trainings. They've embraced the resulting strategies. They've really worked hard to implement them, and um, you know the principals at each one of these schools um, has 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 also worked to really support these things that we have presented um, um, to them over the past couple of years. And and as as Dr. Cancel said, we we are seeing growth. 
The other thing um, that we have really committed to is thinking about academic supports at the elementary level, but also keeping um, in mind that we need to focus on the non-academics. So um, this year, we're happy to say that all of our K-5s and our two K-8s have adopted PBIS, Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports. We're also beginning um, PBIS at the Barrett Russell, and we're dabbling a little bit with the Gilmore. So we're very excited about that. Um, and really, that has, that's the Office of Learning and Teaching working with, um, in collaboration with the Special Education Department. Um, we're seeing a sharp decrease in our office referrals at each one of these schools, and we really feel that that has just helped us to protect learning across the district. Like, a, for instance, is when that would come into play in a classroom? PBIS? Right. So um, one of the things that PBIS does is it um, allows you to develop a, a, a team within the building, and you focus as a team to think about what, what um, problem areas there might be in terms of student behavior. Where do students need that positive reinforcement? Where do they need common language around expectations? Sometimes it happens first in the cafeteria or it happens first um, at, at recess. Those tend to be areas of, of, um, that might be problematic. The team would then work on um, some structures to support those environments that may be more challenging for kids. Um, and what eventually happens is the the positive intervention brings itself into the classroom and teachers begin to think about um, how to really teach pro-social skills how to really teach positive behavior as opposed to being reactive to um, some negative behaviors that students are displaying did I answer your question it doesn't seem like I did mr. Minicello you have a puzzled look <laughs> Um, implementation of PBIS okay. strategy. So, strategy. so a lot of a lot of um, <laughs> I'm trying. So you may have seen a little bit of it when you were at the Brookfield visiting. You saw kids walking like this, peace and quiet in the hallway. That that kind of thing because it may have been that the school felt that you know the hallways is an area where we really just want to get um, some structures around the way kids are because they're you know walking from place to place. So the school might say the school-based PBIS team might say the hallway is something that we want to work on so we want to work on something um, that will reinforce behavior in the hallway and then what you'll see is you'll see each one of the schools rewarding that kind of positive behavior um, the um, our known has pause the Baker has Raptors what do you have pause. The baker also has pause. So students are being reinforced. And then there are all kinds of um, incentives that go with students receiving so many pause or they actually get to pull out of a, um, at the end of the week they get a reward, that kind of thing. So many pause is some kind of positive um, reinforcement for the class. And that translates into how, I guess how does that translate into um, learning. Okay. So um, the PBIS is data driven. Um, any school that adopts PBIS has to adopt um, an actual system where they are inputting their office referrals. So what it does is you have to track your office referrals as a school and you'll say, um, you know, we get a lot of kids from the cafeteria being sent to the office. So that would then be the place where you would focus some attention as a school on. Um, and, and what it does is it allows the school to say where, where are we seeing issues surfacing and how can we maybe take a proactive approach whether it's sort of bringing in um, you know a student assembly talking about what are some expectations around the way that you should behave in the cafeteria or recess or something like that. It really is um, based on the concept that kids need reminders and they need to be taught how to um, behave appropriately in different settings within the school. Um, and because you're looking at office referrals and you're linking office referrals to places where there may be problems, by putting those proactive measures in, spa in, in place, you're seeing um, less kids going to the office. So for me, you know, 
when kids aren't in the office, they, there's more time on learning, there's more time in the classroom. And when we look at the data, we see a marked decrease with office referrals. So those are less kids in the office, more kids in the classroom, um, and we're talking sharp decreases everywhere. So I think it just does make a difference when we're talking about time on learning and uninterrupted time with students academically. You got me there. Did I? Now, I? now I understand. And I feel bad. I'm certainly not the expert. Like I'm, I have experts in the audience, and they're probably going, "Well, she should have said this," but maybe they can. It was, it, it was a long road, but we, we, you brought me to the finish line. Thank you. Okay. So as Dr. Cancel said, we have learned a lot from the kinds of things that um, we have utilized to support um, our priority schools, uh, Huntington and East. And some of those things we're actually putting into practice or beginning to think about at, at the three schools that we, that we have some concerns at right now. So two of our schools, the Baker and the Arnone, um, last year participated in training where they actually began to adopt professional learning communities in their schools. We were able to create a structure that allowed for um, time for teachers to meet every single week. Um, and this is actually a um, this PLC model comes from um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and the Center for Collaborative Education, and it does not cost us anything. It's actually a model that we uh, piloted at these two schools and we're going to continue to do this year. Okay, and then the other thing that we've been able to do at these schools is really begin to think about staffing structures and can we put some low cost supports in place to target instruction and remediation. So um, the schools that we're talking about, they have part-time interventionists, they had them last year, there's two at each school, two at the Raymond, two at, two at the Baker, two at the Arnone that support instruction and in ELA and math, um, and these are part-time positions in each one of those buildings, but um, they're able to make a pretty solid impact because sometimes we're able to get um, people who have had experience in education, so they're able to really come in and support instruction um, without, without um, very much direction from us. The other thing um, is protected class size. This is a tough one, um, as you were reminded earlier. We have really tried at these three schools to protect class size as much as we can, given the fact that um, our schools are so large and, and we're growing everywhere. But when we can, we look at specific grade levels and we say we're really going to try to give those three schools a stable population of students. So smaller class size and also the same students over time so that there's less transiency and there's more continuity. So this year, um, we looked at the concept of school liaisons, and it was something that proved to be effective at Huntington and East. And so we have um, assigned school liaisons, uh, folks from the district, to each one of these three, three focus schools. The Baker School has Dr. Ronan, who is the coordinator of math and science. The Arnone School has Karen McCarthy, the coordinator of Title I services. And the Raymond School has me. <laughs> And I already see that helping with communication because it really allows um, the district liaisons to spend time in each one of the schools. The district liaisons meet with me. I, in turn, get to meet with uh, Superintendent Smith. And it really has streamlined communication already, just having those folks be assigned to those schools. So one of the things that um, Without really knowing where we stand um, budget-wise, we, we really want to at least begin conversations, and this is a very initial conversation, that, that we probably are going to need to invest in these schools um, in, in some different ways. We, we do believe that if we were to invest in some additional staff, it would um, support each one of these schools tremendously, um, and, and not necessarily tonight, but we'll begin to have these conversations about what these staffing structures might look like, what might help these schools um, in, in ways that, that um, we'll really be able to see that, that push for um, improved achievement. 
um, and, and each of these schools um, are at varying levels of um, technology. Interestingly enough, the, Ar the Arnon is in my head. It's one of the newer schools, but I would say it has less technology than some of our older schools. And just thinking about really the way that we're moving and all of the, um, the digital learning and the online um, application of you know the different things that we have, whether we're talking about math or science, that really does put a school at a deficit. Um, students are more engaged if we have the technology and, and we are already utilizing online curriculum. So we just need to make sure that the schools have that um, ability to be able to utilize that. Facilities upgrades. Um, the Raymond is in my head. Um, Dr. Cancel mentioned um, the the wonderful pods at the Raymond. Um, the walls were scheduled, I believe, to um, be put up at the Raymond School last summer. Um, some pods were done, but not all of them could be done because we had to devote um, folks' effort and attention to the Barrett Russell. And that really is one thing the Raymond School feels as though would make a, a, a big difference in, in um, really the, the classroom environment, the learning environment for students. And where walls did go up, teachers are feeling that it made quite a positive difference in, in, in really the classroom environment, the classroom structure. That's it. Okay. Roll the credit. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, I don't know if we have any questions, but there is something that I do want to uh, just underscore. Um, we, we wanted to make sure that you knew just how, um, how challenging it is. We have a number of schools that are potentially level four schools. Mm -hmm. And we do have this history of intervening successfully with schools that were struggling just as much. And so we're, we're really hoping to be able to apply a lot of those lessons at the schools, but there are also new challenges that we weren't facing back then. And so it, you know, I hate to say it, it will be an interesting time, but um, the challenge is great. There's no two ways about it. We do have some good lessons that we've learned in the past and success to build on. But I, I just wanted to put that out there that um, we really do have a challenge with a number of our schools. One of the things that I would like to bring to your attention this evening is, uh, as you have heard, we have uh, designated the Raymond School, the Baker School, and the Iron Own School as our focus schools. Starting about two weeks ago, I paid a visit to every one of the schools. Uh, I had staff members that came to each of these meetings, you know, st and when I say staff members, what I liked about this was it was everybody from the custodian, the cafeteria workers, the teachers, people came together because what I'm seeing, and I see this all over Brockton, but what I'm seeing in these schools is people do care. They, you know, people are coming to work, they're giving their all, they want to make sure that our children have these opportunities. So uh, tonight, I know many of the teachers, as I'm looking out into the audience, they had uh, very tough questions for me as superintendent as to how we were going to get together and to support them, to make sure that they were able to deal with many of the issues that come into the classroom every single day that sometimes get in the way of teaching and learning. So I've assured every one of those groups, I thank you tonight for coming here to hear the presentation. I assured them that we would be talking about the very difficult work that goes on each and every day in our schools. And as you heard uh, Liz talk about, I learned this from Principal Saba, and I know she's in the audience. And as John Jerome will attest, we would go to her school and she would have a list that she would hang up on a, a chart piece of paper. And it was kind of her wish list. It was, this is what I need to do to help my children to succeed. I want to be a, a STEM magnet school. I want to really keep a cap on class size, especially with the large numbers of English language learners, free and reduced lunch, the high poverty rate. All of these things were things that she had a check off list and as a district with our liaison, and Dr. Cancel forgot to tell you that he was actually the liaison <laughs> for the Huntington School at the time and served them well along with East Middle School. 
that those ideas are brought back to the superintendent. And when we're building a budget and when we're finding grants and you've allowed me to build a grants office, to start to look for those kind of supports for these priority schools. I sat with every one of the principals and their leadership teams and we did a wish list. And as you said, I, I'm not going to read them off to you, but when I sat with Carol McGrath, she talked about you know the walls and making the classrooms so the children were able to focus on the instruction. We talked about additional interventionists, uh, SEI classes, additional Title I support. We know what we need to do to certainly increase the scores or to give our, our kids a fighting chance. I wish we had every dollar to do that. I don't think we have that because as you can see, all of our schools are a priority. All of our children are, are a priority. But I feel good about working with these schools, with our liaisons. I sit now, because of the grant, the extended learning time grant and your redesign grant at East, I sit every other week with uh, you know, June Saba and Kelly Silva. And we talk about the things that are happening in their schools and ways that we can make them successful. I just spent Saturday at East Middle School with Kelly Silva and Laurie Silva, who is her liaison this year, and talking about things that we can do to improve uh, the opportunities for kids at those schools. And we'll continue to do this you know, for your superintendent focus schools this year. I'm sure have a lot of questions. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. It was it was a different um, presentation that we've heard in the past. Of, you know, I think you you um, showed us a lot of the data in a different way, and it, it's good to see it from different perspectives. And I appreciate that, Ethan. Um, I do have a question back to one of the first slides between like slide five and six, where you talk about the SCPI, and you gave us the um, scores for like say three to five, the the e ECPI, okay, on slide five, when you take a school like, for instance, the Davis, they're at 61.2 for grades three to five, but then for the ECPI for, uh, for English, English language arts, jumps up to 84.4 for grades six to eight. That's a huge jump for the right. same school yep. from different grade levels. Um, any idea what you attribute that huge jump to? Well, we, we've looked at this at both Davis and Raymond. And um, one of the things, and, and we've looked at it at Brockton High School, one of the things that we're seeing is, you know, it, it sounds repetitive, but here it goes. The longer kids stay in the Brockton public schools, mm -hmm. the better they do. And so the, the challenges that some of our students face early on, they're, they're rather large. But if, if they can stay in the school, in that particular school, if they're not bouncing around to different, uh, to different schools or different cities even, um, they, they really do tend to do better. And uh, th there is also, to be 100% fair, there are some different sorts of programs at certain levels. Kids you know, grow out of the program. So if, if you are an English language learner, you may, after a number of years, have learned your English. So that's no longer being pick, picked up on your scores. That, you're not a good speaker of English. But that's, I think that's part of it. Well, and you bring up a, an interesting point because the Davis and the Raymond are the only two K to eight schools. Right. So they do make dramatic jumps between grades yep. three and five and six to eight. So yep. that's an interesting point. Um, and when you take some of these stunning successes, and there's a few great examples, mm -hmm. uh, like what East has been doing, and you know some mm -hmm. of the other schools that they've just gone off the charts. And have you been able to identify what practices they've put in place that have really been key, have been key um, indicators or key, um, you know? made a key difference in the increase. It's really just uh, that we can transfer to other schools. Well, I'll answer it sort of generally, and then I'll uh, ask Liz if she has any additional insights. But um, one of the things that we're doing is we're really trying to improve all the schools. And so the, the understanding by design approach that's, that's really important. And where schools may not have been doing such a good job on the planning and the, the collaboration being all on the same page, I think in some of those schools, you've seen some more dramatic gains. 
You do see, you know, North is a school that springs to mind. That's a school that's really made some great gains, mm -hmm. although it's not listed. Um, there, there are other schools as well that have that have done well. There are some fabulous teachers. There are some fabulous principals. I would say that just about everyone is working hard, and I think that these practices, you know, like UBD, that that just the citywide sort of trainings where everyone gets on the mm -hmm. same page. I think that we're seeing those sorts of uh, those sorts of things yield results. And I do want to say, you know, back to Mr. Minicello's point about the PBIS or his question, just as a data guy who doesn't even worry about what they're doing, you know, walking through the halls like that, I just look at the referrals and I say, okay, if they're not in the office and they are in the classroom, and when they are in the classroom, they're learning, it, it, you got you to gotta be in the classroom to learn. I mm -hmm. mean, you'd think that's the first step. So things like that, attending to the the social and emotional needs of the children. I think that, that all these things together make it work. I don't think, unfortunately, there's one sort of silver bullet, like if you do this, your scores are going to go up. Mm -hmm. If you teach better and more effectively, your scores will go up. And that's really, really complicated. So I'm going to let Liz give you some details. Yeah. And I really just think that teachers are able to teach better when they have consistent time to collaborate and plan. And I would say that it's one small piece of it, but um, when you look at the Huntington and East, um, making sure that teachers have that time, making sure that that time is, is, is directed and focused, and um, I think that's huge. Um, and as I did say, it was something that we were able to put in place at the Arnone and Baker. It's a different model. It's structured quite differently. Um, from the very beginning, I want to commend the teachers because once they had the time, the agendas, you know, that they developed together focused always on, le on the learners. They were very, very ambitious. Um, but I think that um, that's one thing that, you know, like a school like the Raymond, we don't have a way to give them that structured time. Um, and, and I think that when teachers have that, when they have the ability to talk, collaborate, and plan together, we do. We do see improvement. And, and it, it is, it's one small piece, but it's I think it's something that makes a difference small pieces add up like you said yeah. Ethan. you know the just even like the breakfast in the classroom absolutely the collaboration with the uh, teachers yep. you know um, it all it all in that the positive behavior interventions mm -hmm. that type of thing you know if they're not in the nurse's office if they're not homesick if they're yep. you know not in the principal's office then uh, just one other um, I guess comment more than anything is as we identify these focus schools and we've identified priority schools and we work to keep class sizes down, we look to put more resources in those schools, it, it's really um, a challenge for us as a committee. It's a challenge for me because every one of our schools is a priority mm -hmm. and we want class sizes to be low in every class, in mm -hmm. every school. and. The last thing I think any one of us wants to do on this committee is to put resources at the expense right. of other children in the district, you know, and that's, that's, a, that's a tough balance for us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think we need to try to look towards ways that we can alleviate class sizes district-wide, you know, work on our facilities and, you know, on expanding facilities, expanding, you know, where we where we get the biggest bang for our every dollar we spend, mm -hmm. so it's it's really f focused on exactly what's happening in the classroom and and you know the staff that teaches our kids directly, you know, and anything that helps them to do their job better and teach our children better. So um, you know, I don't I don't even want it to be projected that we only focus on specific schools because that can't be further from the truth. Right. Every school is a focus of ours. Mm -hmm. right. and, and just to, it's, it's just again historically reporting, the schools were able to capture these grants and they're sizable grants. Yeah. Now we had to get a little traction at first and in that initial investment in Huntington where we could say to the state, look, we seem to know what we're doing, look at the results here. And then we're, we're, you know, the schools worked really hard to win these mm -hmm. grants, and they're not easy. And so now we have a person who's really going to be specializing in this, and.
and I have all the faith in the world in, in her abilities to attract these outside dollars. But you're right, Brockton's success, and, and I'm very, very proud of, about this one. Brockton's su success at these particular schools did not come at the expense of others, and that's not the model other districts um, follow. And that really is, you know, that's what we sort of inherit from people like John and you know former school committee members who really insisted that that was the way we were going that was our strategy we weren't going to rob peter to pay paul so it's point well taken mm -hmm. well, thanks again for the great presentation you know, such great points and again this is this is a much larger picture and I hope by the time I'm able to unveil our strategic plan and my entry plan which which we're working on it'll be sometime in the spring but the point you bring up again is when I talk to the principals it comes down to professional development for principals and for teachers when I've spoken to every one of those principals it's about building a culture with your teachers your staff it's a team effort whether it's professional learning communities, whether it's additional professional development. I know Colleen Proudler is doing strategies for her teachers, you know, especially in the area of literacy. When I talked about in the school committee has supported me in bringing on additional grants people that will focus every week on our executive team to tell us what grants they're looking at and again we'll be able to sit there and figure out how they support not just the priority schools but schools throughout the district. So it is a, a much larger picture. Um, we'll be able to report you know a lot of this back to you as to when we go through the budget process as to how we are supporting not just our priority schools but all of our schools. Mr. Ethan, uh, I assume that uh, every district, at least uh, the, the urban districts, uh, would have a uh, someone in your capacity, uh, perhaps under a different title or whatever. But your contemporaries, if I if I may. Do you collaborate with them and, and, and talk about what's going on in other districts? Yeah, we do informally, and I've also uh, joined a group that the, uh, the regional education labs, it's funded by the uh, U.S. Department of Education, and it's the Urban School Improvement Network, I think it's called, and uh, there's specifically people in my position mm -hmm. in various urban districts around New England. So there's some New York State, Worcester, Lowell, um, some in Connecticut, some in New York, uh, more towards the city, like Yonkers. So we, we collaborate and uh, we, we talk about what's going on, but it's also under the leadership and guidance of the regional ed lab. I, I guess what I'm getting at is because of the MCAS, is there more of a like a gateway city type thing that you, that you guys do? And then now when we go forward with the new park, it's going to be more national, I guess, huh? In terms of uh, the, the testing, we're going to, it's, it's going to be more yeah. state against state or so forth, right? Yeah, well, and, and the park is the big unknown right now. Right. It really is. We don't know. The state has not formally committed to it in the sense of making it officially it's part of its accountability system. Mm -hmm. it's, it is literally testing it to see how it stacks up and if it meets Massachusetts standards. So there, there are a lot of unknowns out there, but um, we're, we're definitely talking about it. It is a challenge that all of the urban districts are facing. and. We are the only urban district that hasn't had a level four school, so that's something that we're still, we don't know about that experience firsthand. Yeah, I guess the park thing is, uh, is certainly something to be concerned about, especially because of the federal dollars that would be dangled in front of us. Uh, do we take a step backward to grab that money, or do we take that money and then move forward uh, afterwards? I, I don't know, it's, it's a conundrum, I, I, the way I look at it. Well, Anyways, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. I was just going to say that there's certainly going to be a lot more coming with Park yeah. after we start to field test. But as Ethan said, you are the only urban district that has remained a level three district. And it is very difficult with all of the gateway city issues that we deal with each and every day. Mr. Mitchell. Great presentation. Um, 
I think the one thing you really said is that there is no magic bullet. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of moving parts. And um, mm -hmm. the culture in the school and the culture of the whole school system, I think, um, adds to the individual successes up there. Um, you know, the combination, we saw it in the middle schools, the um, collaborative time that teachers have to discuss with one another, um, <clears throat> even the different subject areas, the teachers getting together and being able to talk about certain students and what uh, the needs of those students, even in the different disciplines, um, benefits, you know, and we've seen the benefits at the middle schools. Um, the more we have for professional development and the opportunities for the teachers to get together and see what their peers are doing, um, the better. You know, Bill was saying, you know, the breakfast in the classroom, having kids go to school, and Andy, you know, chimed in as well, you know, having kids with a full belly in the morning, well rested, I mean, it can only add, you know, Liz, finally you brought me to where I needed to be. Um, Sorry. You know, you know, less time, yeah, yeah, long walk, all you had to say was, you know, less time out of the office, more time in the classroom, uh, and I would have gotten it, but it was a, it was a long walk there, but okay. Um, um, but I think one of the big, biggest um, successes of our school system is for all of us is that if we don't teach in isolation, if we share best teaching practices with one another, if there's communication between the principals about the successes they're having and the ways they're getting them and highlighting what certain teachers are doing to, you know, those pockets of success, um, the sharing of that information, the time that you actually schedule with um, your staff as well as the principals to get together and share what's going on in their buildings, that's only going to benefit the system as a whole. So, um, you know, I, I'm encouraged by, by what I'm seeing. Um, I certainly have some concerns with some of the schools that I notice are slipping and um, we'll have to address that. But um, excellent presentation and um, you know we will do whatever we can do to continue to support you. You know that. So thank you. Mr. Robbins. Um, I, I kind of prefer to think of this whole thing in a different context a little bit in terms of like a silver bullet or the one best practice that all schools need to share, I think about it more as like we need to build a foundation. Um, so there's this foundational learning and then there's all the extra great things we can do once we have the foundation. You know, at the Huntington, they had to prove they were capable and prepared and ready for the for the extra things that they wanted. And once they did that, then we, we found a way to get them those things. Um, you know, we spend pre-K and K and first grade establishing foundational skills for kids that then they can build on. You know, if we give teachers 30 minutes extra teaching time, but we haven't built a foundation for developing lesson plans and created the common planning space and, and established a school culture and, and behavioral interventions, then that time is still just wasted time. Um, and so I think about kind of building those foundational skills and I've, I've had the opportunity to sit in on the Understanding by Design trainings and I've been fortunate to be able to come to a few of the district-wide trainings and I went and sat in on the um, uh, trauma-centered learning environment training at the Baker and, and uh, you know I see those kind of foundational things being built and to me that's a really promising step and, and it gives me 100 percent confidence um, beyond just kind of the some of the small trends of, of little gains um, that, that those schools will make progress because they're building an incredibly strong foundation, starting with the leadership and, and, and building through the teachers and, and then you know, the support from the district to build the skills um, that will really support all these extra resources that are going to come from our amazing new grant writer. Um, <laughs> You know, team. But if if the foundation isn't there, team. Sorry. Um, you know, but if the foundation isn't there, then then we kind of lose what what could be gained by some of those things. And and so, um, you know, I'm I'm encouraged by the the foundation building that I'm seeing happening in in our struggling schools, but in all of our schools, and and really kind of concerted efforts from the superintendent down to building principals and, and classroom teachers. Um, to kind of buy in and, and get on the same page and and uh, and you know move forward together and that's that's in a it, you know unless you're in the schools it's kind of hard 
sometimes to understand or, or maybe even believe it's happening, but when you get out into our, and all of us have had opportunities to be in the schools, you, you see it happening right in front of you, and it's, it's a really, um, really neat thing. <laughs> Well, you know, one of the things, again, and, and I want to thank the school committee, uh, whether it was the beginning retreat in August, the continued retreat just uh, last week, one of the things that you have resourced the district, and you heard me talk about it from the day I interviewed, you know, resourcing us for success. And what you've done is you give, you've given us, you know, rather than John Jerome doing three and four jobs, you've given us an executive director for six to 12, including, including the alternative schools. Dr. Cliff Murray will work with the Raymond School and all the middle schools to develop those strengths and those foundations. You have um, an executive director, uh, which is pre-K to five, and you heard me say to you, you know, during the retreat, you know, we were the only urban district without an early childhood coordinator. And you know, we're gonna be looking at that as we move forward to, again, support that early learning. So I really do wanna thank the school committee for continuing to work, you know, with the superintendent, with our leadership team, and on behalf of all our teachers to make sure that we're positioning them and resourcing them for success. Ethan. Uh... Excellent report. My fifth year of watching your presentations <laughs> now, so you do a great job of taking a lot of data and putting it into a, a format that uh, we can actually get the message that you're trying to convey. Um, so my couple takeaways there, first of all, there's a lot of good news in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're spending a lot of time talking about the challenges, but there's a lot of good news in there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we should look past that. Um, the troubling piece for me a little bit, and i just interested in a little more comment from either of you, is how do you account for such a wide disparity between some schools? I mean, in a couple of those graphs, the performance levels of the schools at the top and the bottom, there's just a huge difference. Our schools are very different, um, and in some cases, we're talking about schools, you know, that are quite larger than others with with a, a very challenging demographic. So it's it's absolutely some of that, um, and you know, it's one thing that I each school has its own kind of personality, if you will, and um, the student population within it, I think, does um, help to sort of inform its achievement story um, and and we do I mean in we have elementary schools that are very 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 big um, and it is concerning um, okay you know from from a data perspective though this it, it's important it, it I don't spend a lot of time concentrating on schools. I like to present the district because when you look at school levels, you see lots of, you know, moving around, but you can't figure out why it's moving. It's just a lot of noise sometimes, but you definitely see kids in all different schools doing really, really well, perfect scores, and you see kids doing terribly. And so there, there are some, you know, real big differences. I'm, I don't, everyone knows me, I don't pull any punches on, on just facts. Angelo School is going to get a boost because it has the TAG program. You know that and I know that. Other schools that lose kids to the TAG program, their scores aren't going to look good. That doesn't mean the school isn't doing well. But as Liz was saying, in many cases, the programs in the school can determine the results. Liz asks me questions like this, and I, June would ask me questions like this all day long. What would happen if you took this group yeah, out? He answers or them what happily. If, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, would you, what would happen if you just looked at kids who stayed in the school from third grade to fifth grade? And so in every single school, you can find some real pockets of success, and you can find some you know areas of concern. So um, I... Th I think that what you're asking is a great question. We don't quite have the solution because we know the answer has to be everyone has to do better. So just because you're in a challenging situation, so what is basically the answer? You have to do better. But it is the right question to ask. And when we do find the things, that's what I like so much about our approach with the priority schools. We were trying things out. June tried out uniforms. You know what? It really worked. It was, a, it was a success. It's a small area that you may not think impacts academics, but it worked. But they tried out Envision's math there. They, they really, we could try out things in the, in the schools and then maybe spread it. 
I'm always going to be concerned when I see variation that's big, and we need to know what's causing it and what can we control there. And I know that one of the factors in Easton Huntington of, of many is you talked about protecting class size, and that worries me a little bit as we look at gaining, I mean, a net gain of 450, 500 new students every year. We're not building any buildings. So, um, and I know we are, with the resources we have, trying to look at buildings we might be able to bring back online, but that's a real concern to me that what, what will be our ability to control class sizes over the next few years if we keep growing at a net gain of, you think of 450, 500 students, that's an entire elementary school. Absolutely. And we're, we're growing by one of those every year that's right. without really adding any buildings. Yeah. So. Um, I, I think as we're working on the budget and trying to do some long-range planning, I think one of our biggest challenges is, is class size. And one last quick question. When you're looking at our statistics and when you're comparing us to other school districts, almost all of those other school districts have a September 1st cutoff on entry level at age five. Ours is December 31st. How much of an impact does that have? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. There's an easy answer, but it's wrong. The easy answer is we will do much better if, if you exclude what we call the Burr Babies. You'll make significant gains because Burr Babies are overrepresented in that, you know, the zero to 25 point category. The reason why that's wrong that's assuming that the kids are going to get something good when they're not in school. And I'm not willing to say that that's going to happen. So it's, I don't, I don't know how we could do the study without saying, you know, these kids have to be doing something that's productive and safe in early childhood. So it's, it's, it's a tough, it, there's no doubt about it, the Burr Babies, it's clear. So is the answer really not so much about eliminating the Burr Babies, is the answer to have a pre-K program Absolutely. for four-year-olds yes. so all of the kids from that year are picking yep. up the extra year because yep. it's something I've been looking at what other cities do. Now New York City has universal pre-K yep. now yep. and a lot of cities are going to it. I know it's a, it's a budget issue mm -hmm. for us and a space issue and I think we've talked about it at one time or another every year I've been here, but somehow we've got to find the will and the way to get four-year-old kids into school, particularly when they're English language learners. I mean, exactly. kids need that extra year. Yeah, and um, you know, I, I come back to the slide. I put the school committee support first on the lessons learned, and the superintendent has mentioned this as well. These are not easy things when you're talking about what the city of Brockton is going to look like in 5, 15, 20 years. It's not easy today to say, oh yeah, let's build schools for the kids who may be coming here three or four years from now. But you're right, 400 kids, that's, that's a school, that's per year. And so it's not going to be easy. I do not envy any one of you. But my position is easy. I just tell you what, what the story is and, you know, what the data says. But, you know, these, these are the, the difficult, and John laughs. laughs, these are the difficult decisions that, I mean, you're right, the data is clear. It's the, the Burr baby issue, it, the solution does strike me as, yeah, you're right. You should have early, early childhood. It, we know what that does in other districts. And of course, we address that at the retreat. We do have a, you know, we can't lose those students right now. We have a plan in place um, when we have an opportunity to talk about a facility master plan. You know, we want to talk about being ready that if, in fact, we do end up with funding for our pre-K students, we're ready to go. So this is something that we, we are already having discussions about. In my final quick comment, the, the dilemma that Patty alluded to is how do we find a way to find some extra help where it's needed without unfairly taking away from kids in other schools which sounds correct to everyone except the parents in those three low performing schools who wonder why their kids are going to a school that doesn't do as well as other schools around the city and you know I think we we want a system where the educational opportunity is equal no matter what school you go to so anyhow it's, it's a great report and I think at the end of the day we have big challenges but there's an awful lot of good news in those numbers too thank you thank you
Are we ready to Questions? Sure. Okay, uh, the next uh, item of business is I do want to uh, announce to you that uh, we have made uh, an appointment to our new Deputy Superintendent of Learning and Teaching. And although we can't replace John Jerome in many ways, we are going to announce to you this evening uh, that Elizabeth Barry is our new Deputy Superintendent of Learning and Teaching. her Liz. She has been in the district for 16 years. She started out as an elementary teacher, I think a sixth grade teacher, at the Raymond School, probably teaching in a pod. And uh, moved up, I had been an administrator uh, actually very early in her career, worked uh, under Catherine Bryan at the time. She has uh, been an assistant principal at the Angelo School. She worked very closely with uh, Principal Ryan Powers. They were an excellent team. Uh, Liz came uh, and became our executive director for, and I don't know how you do, pre-K to eight, but she was our executive director pre-K to eight, most recently pre-K to five, and we're, we're excited to have her on board to lead our instructional team. So when I just spoke to you and talked about your executive director, Cliff Murray, we will now have to replace Liz with an executive director K to five. Uh, she has, again, I'm, I'm gonna miss somebody so I certainly won't name them, but I see many of our coordinators, Dr. Ronan out in the audience. Uh, people that, that are her leadership team, she will take a much wider role. She will work very closely. I see Bob Perkins here, our associate principal, Principal Wolder. We'll work with the whole district and lead our instructional team. So you have a big job ahead of you. Uh, I'm very excited to have you here. Because this is an appointment of a deputy superintendent, appointments of deputy superintendents are subject to school committee approval. So I'll entertain a motion on the floor by Mr. Minicello, second by Mr. Robinson. All in favor? Unanimous. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very much. I, I just um, want to thank you. I appreciate everyone's confidence in me. I am very, very excited about this this new role. Um, and as Superintendent Smith, I, Smith said, I have been in the district for over 16 years, and I have worked with so many talented and dedicated people. Um, many of them are in this room. Um, and I just feel fortunate for that. Um, I, I will say that this appointment is bittersweet because, and I'm going to sneak this in because I won't be able to do it again um, because it, it does mean that Mr. Jerome is, is retiring and um, you know just a true mentor to me and I have learned so much from Mr. Jerome um, over the past several several years I actually met him 16 years ago at the Raymond School um, and he has been um, a mentor to me ever since then <laughs> So, Mr. Jerome, I am one of many people who um, am just going to miss you tremendously and um, wish you a, a very happy retirement and a well-deserved retirement at that. So, thank you. So, uh, as Ms. Barry alluded to, uh, our dear friend, uh, already? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Discussion. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because you weren't so nice well, earlier? I take it and I give it. What can I say? Mr. Um, Minichello. Well, the only, you know, the only reason I'm going to say something is nice is because her husband came and told me I have to. So, um, but um, I've known Liz uh, since she was at, when she was the assistant principal over at the Angelo with Brian Powers, and um, I was very impressed with that school. I was very impressed with Liz. Um, she is very, I can say this about Liz Barry, she is very balanced. She is very calm. She is very thoughtful. Um, she is dedicated. She works extremely hard. Um, I've been down and around Central and I see her vehicle there 
sometimes I'm going, wow, she, she's still there. Um, she's a wonderful addition for superintendent, deputy superintendent of uh, teaching and learning. And um, I congratulate you. You're very well deserved. And I know that you will serve the students well. And I know you don't like people saying nice things about <laughs> you. But um, I might as well get under your nerves a second yeah. time tonight. Yeah. So Thank congratulations. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Anyone else? Okay, so uh, as Miss Barry is being appointed to a position, that means that uh, someone else is, is vacating it. So um, although Mr. Jerome is still working with us till the end of February, because of the way the school schedule works out with the vacation, uh, this is actually his final official school committee meeting as deputy superintendent. So we can't let an evening like this go by without uh, a little recognition. Uh, so I'd like to invite John up for a presentation of a special award. I'll invite the vice chair, Mr. Minicello, up also. And I'll ask uh, the superintendent to actually make the presentation. I have to buy suits with pockets. <laughs> Come right up here. John, how many school committee meetings? Meeting. I was going to say, how many I school committee meetings have you attended? <laughs> Too many, he's going to say. <laughs> well, this might officially be John's last school committee meeting. I know many of you have heard me say John is going to continue to support our new administrators, our deputy superintendents, uh, Dr. Murray in his new role. He's helping me with the budget along the way. And like I said, although he might not be there day to day and will be doing wonderful things with his, his grandson and his family, we want to thank him for over 43 years of dedicated service to our students, our families, our community, and as Liz said, to all of us. So thank you very much. Thank you. John Jerome tributes, we'll never get out of here tonight, but uh, I, I do have to make a quick comment and just say I've only known John for the past five years here, but uh, uh, he is an incredible guy and I've always just been, I've become very fond of him in our years working together. I don't think, and with all due respect to the new superintendent, I don't think anyone's had the breadth and depth of knowledge of the entire Brockton Public Schools that John possesses, and I think we we are losing something uh, with John's retirement. So others will grow and fill the void, but uh, we absolutely lose something. And the best thing about John is that uh, he's a true gentleman in every sense of the word. And uh, we'll miss you, John. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Okay, I'd like to have uh, Deputy Superintendent Thomas come up. We're going to talk about our facility master plan. Good evening. Um, we spoke at the retreat about um, going forward with the facilities master plan and uh, Mayor Carpenter spoke about the class size um, issue and how we grew over 450 students this year uh, and we're projected to probably grow that many students over the next three years so we spoke at the retreat of um, looking at the budget this year of um, developing a basically a 20-year master facilities master plan so um, it's something that we spoke about to look at either bringing you know we right now looking to bring another school back online um, by September of 2015 as we're looking at the Whitman School right now the architects should be done by the middle of um, uh, the actually the end of this week of their report and feasibility study and to get that building ready to open again in September of 2015 looking at like an early childhood center for that building as we talk about pre-k classrooms so that's the 
um, short-term goal, the long-term goal of the facility's master plan is to look at the 20-year plan. Wh where do we go if uh, we keep growing by four to 500 students each year? So um, it's just uh, Superintendent Smith wanted me to talk about that tonight. So when we move forward with our bu budget planning, uh, a facility's master plan could range anywhere between about 150 to $250,000 to have a, uh, a consultant group come in meet with the city council, the mayor, the school committee, uh, the chief financial officer, and then uh, a bunch of community meetings around, uh, ward meetings around the city to um, listen to parents and community members and to see where our demographics are going and see how where, uh, um, where we're growing in size. And as we know, we need a school somewhere in the south zone um, and they'll, they'll give us all that data and, and help us move forward and, and make informed decisions as we as we move forward over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So um, that's something that Superintendent Smith wanted me to speak about tonight and we can answer any questions about how we move forward with that but something we'll have to budget or uh, build in the budget for um, July 1st. Because we could put a bid out. It would, get out, it would have to go out to bid for a company to come in and put that plan together and we could put that out in July when the new fiscal year kicks in treat to everybody if we have a facility master plan we're better situated that if money comes from school building assistance funds that we actually have plans in place so yeah, when you uh, when you apply for um, a new school, actually now that I, I'm doing the the current statement of interest for the accelerated repair programs for some new roofs and windows, um, every application there's a section that asks you if you have a facilities master plan, uh, and the MSBA puts a lot of weight on that. Um, not as much if you're looking for new roofs and windows and boilers, but if you're looking for a new school, they're going to want to see a facilities master plan. Um, if you if they don't see that, it's going to have you're going to have a hard time getting an application approved. And again, Brockton is at an 80 percent reimbursement from the MSBA. So, this is Joyce. I know that we've been discussing at length like the retreat. Um, one of the things I think that they came out of that was the full support of the committee to go forward with that that bid process. Um, and you just mentioned about it being in fiscal the next fiscal year to finance it, but. Is there anything stopping you or delaying uh, putting it out to bid prior to that, um, even if it's not in this year's uh, fiscal, but if it's not in this year's bu budget? We could. We could put it out to bid, and then um, of waiting until July. And, is what I'm saying. and Aldo, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. We can put it out to bid, and then hold on awarding the bid. Well, it's a pending funding. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just hate to wait till July to. No, I agree with you. You know. Yep. Um, and does it require a formal vote from the full committee at a school committee meeting to be able to put that forward? I'm not sure. Not actually appropriating any money at this time. I think because we're not appropriating any money, I don't think a formal action is necessary. Okay. Just as long as we can move forward with it, that's sure. all I care about. Yeah. Yeah, we'll start working on that. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mr. Healy. Would that work in concert with the, uh, uh, the study that, uh, that Dr. Malone had done with the population growth, which seems to have, seems to be on target, as, as I recall. Yeah, uh, NESDEC would they do a study every year. Oh, okay. So they contact. Um, that was that. That's what that study was. Yes, NESDEC um, does that every year, and they'll do another one what for us. What does that cost us? Uh, it's that's free. That's free. Yes. Okay. Oh, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> We're a member of NESDEC, so it's part of the membership, okay. and it's it's not a very expensive at all for the membership, and they provide other services. Yeah, it's been on the it's been on the mark. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I guess we have a final quick comment on the importance of the planning because some may wonder why would we be investing in planning when we don't have the resources today to build a new school. Um, but if we just go back a couple of years ago to the green repair program that allowed us to refurbish eight school buildings, uh, when we originally applied, we only were awarded four schools. And then after that first round, there was the state actually had some money left in the fund, and we were able to 
get in proposals, they entertain four more schools and we ended up with eight instead of four. And the reason we're able to do that is because we had been doing advanced planning a couple of years in advance, knowing that we had bad roofs and, and things of that sort. So because of the fact we had the plans already done, we were able to immediately submit them when we realized there was some more money available and we end up getting eight schools repaired instead of four. So I think the superintendent alluded to that, but it is key that somewhere along the line, the state will come up with a program that may afford us an opportunity to um, get 80% reimbursement towards a new school building, but the only way we'll be eligible for it is if we have a plan that we can show uh, to justify the need for the school. So um, I, I think this is a, a key first step for us to, to bring, in the, bring in the experts and have them evaluate exactly what we've got and what we need for facilities, because there's, there's no doubt we need to create more classroom space. Anyone else? Okay. Is that the rest of yours? Uh, unfinished business. Finance subcommittee. Oh. So, Mr. Minicello, do you want to do the under new business sure. report of the finance subcommittee? Uh, the finance subcommittee of the Brockton Public Schools met earlier this evening here in the little theater at 6:30, whereby we were presented uh, with a presentation from Maxine Richardson and Patricia Dupuy. Um, the topic was the Department of Early Education and CARES uh, FY 2014 rates and the increases that uh, were proposed uh, after the presentation. The um, uh, committee asked several questions, made several comments, and um, reluctantly agreed to increase the rates in order to conform to the required new rates set by uh, EEC. Uh, that is the report, a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All in favor? Approved unanimously. And then we just need to um, approve the motion to accept the EEC's FY 2014 rates um, and to comply with those rates effective March 3, uh, March 3, 2014, effectively putting in the new increase uh, into um, existence. Okay, we have a motion. Seconded by Mr. Henningsen. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Approved unanimously. Good. How about we still were on new business? Uh, any any members of the school committee with uh, other new business? Mr. Minichuk. We were um, invited to participate in a joint uh, informational meeting of Brockton City officials um, this Thursday evening over at West um, at 7 p.m. in the cafeteria. Um, there will be, um, it's going to basically be a presentation by the mayor, the city council, bringing us up to date with respect to current issues, um, public safety, the police chief, economic stabilization, neighborhood development, um, Whitman School, Vicente's Market, public will have an opportunity for questions and answers. From the school side, um, we will be discussing student population and demographics, uh, our school buildings, the state of them, uh, our short-term and long-term goals, um, uh, our improvements, our future improvements, um, initiatives that we put into place in uh, present and future, and Southeastern members will also be there from their school committee and give us updates um, uh, on what's happening over there. Um, and then again, the public will have an opportunity for questions and answers. Um, from our perspective, again, we've been invited to attend and participate. Um, there's, I, I was speaking with um, Superintendent Smith earlier and a couple of the school committee members. Um, there, there's no appointed person that is, you know, presenting. I thought we would present um, um, collaboratively, collectively, you know, all of us um, talking about, you know, things that perhaps, you know, have affected our schools. Uh, Patty certainly is well poised to talk about what's happening at the Davis, some of the repairs, what the state of affairs was of, over at the Davis and what's going on. Um, you know, Andy can certainly talk about, you know, the breakfast initiative. Um, you know, I can certainly speak about a number of different things. The superintendent and uh, Mike Thomas and you know, other members can certainly chime in on what's happening in, in their school. So there, there, there's no you know, designee from the school side where, you know, we're attending 
collectively and you know as a team will basically you know talk to the public uh, I think the public you know is going to have questions comments um, concerns you know class size I'm hearing again that's a repetitive theme especially from parents of younger students um, so um, if you can attend please do um, but um, that uh, in a nutshell I think is a big blurb of what's happening Thursday night so okay. anyone else on the new business I've got a couple quick things. Someone mentioned it earlier tonight, but I just want to also mention that uh, I did have the opportunity to spend some time at Brockton High School this morning at the Science Fair. If you haven't seen one, you got to see it sometime. It's incredible, the level of the work that's being done by the students. Um, I listened to a, a number of presentations of, of projects. I don't know how the judges did it, but uh, I fortunately was not, not judging, just uh, walking around speaking to some of the students, but I was incredibly impressed by the, the complexity and the level of the work that's being done by our students at, at the high school. Um, and then also on a personal note, and I just found this out uh, momentarily, uh, but our uh, cameraman from BCA, Mike Simmons, is leaving us. And uh, so Mike is, now Mike, how long have you been doing the school committee meetings now? Four years. Four years. He's like part of the team. And uh, I never cease to be amazed how many people watch these meetings at home on TV. And people stop and ask and talk about a meeting. So Mike, we want to wish you the best in your future endeavors. And thank you very much for your time here with us uh, broadcasting the meetings. Thank you. Thank you. And if there's no other new business, I'll entertain a motion. Okay. Oh. I think we kind of skipped over oh, um, items to refer to subcommittee. I go right ahead, yes. We okay. jumped a lot out of the I do have one sorry. item I'd like to refer to the Safety and Security Subcommittee in light of the new appointment that's been made by our interim commissioner, Hayden. Yeah. Um, and the. Um, it would have been nice to have had this prior to the appointment, but that being said, um, I'd like to invite Commissioner Hayden to join us to discuss this appointment and, more importantly, dis to discuss the financial implications and the school committee responsibility on those financial implications. Right. So going just forward. so Pat, we didn't have a chance to have a discussion after the meeting, but I think that there are no financial implications potentially until July 1st, so our conversations would be around what implications might be in the new budget going forward. Exactly. There are no implications And how it affects the structure of the school police. There's a right. lot of different changes that right. are being proposed with this appointment. So I'd like us to all kind of vet it out on the, the subcommittee and um, see what sure. we're going to be doing going forward. Yep. Okay, thank you. So that'll be So us. maybe you can speak with him to see what dates are good for him. Yeah, we'll, we'll discuss dates. Okay, great, thank okay. you. That's all I had. Anyone else? Items to refer to subcommittee? Okay, now that we've got that taken care of, I'll entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Motions passed. Meetings adjourned.